Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Cafe Sci here for August of 2022. Uh, our guest this evening is Dr. Andrea Jackman. Uh, before we introduce Dr. Jackman, I would, of course, like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for Cafe Sci PPG uh, and all of you uh, Cafe Sci regulars and fans who join us here month to month. Uh, we really couldn't do Cafe Sci without your support. Uh, so if you have friends, families, sworn enemies, mild acquaintances who might be interested in learning more about science, uh, do us a favor and send them the link to the next online Cafe Sci or bring them as your own guest uh, to the next in-person Cafe Sci. We're going to be back in person at Carnegie Science Center on uh, in October. But you're not here to listen to me ramble on. You're here to... Uh, receive an interesting presentation from Dr. Andrea Jackman. Uh, Andrea is a principal consultant in data science with ABS Group. Prior to joining ABS, she worked for over 10 years with IBM as a consultant on emergency management projects with FEMA, US Army Corps of Engineers, and NOAA after earning her BS in meteorology from Valparaiso University and her PhD in wind science and engineering from Texas Tech. Her past projects and ongoing research interests include the application of civil and industrial engineering principles within disaster and crisis management. She enjoys publishing her project work and findings in academic journals and books, including articles for the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk Reduction and most recently, Harvard Business Review. Uh, and now it is my personal and professional pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Andrea Jackman. Uh, go ahead and take it away, Andrea. It's all yours. Thank you so much. All right, I'll go ahead and give the screen sharing a try here, like we <laughs> like we practiced. Let me know how that looks. That looks perfect. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. I, I'm really looking forward to this. This is a topic that I'm very interested in, very passionate about. And so I think it'll be fun to have a, a conversation. Hopefully we can all learn a few things and uh, think about what we wanna do emergency management wise for the future. I, some of you may have noticed that we're in the middle of a little bit of a global pandemic crisis right now. Um, so maybe some things we'll talk about will be applicable to that. Um, certainly other disasters that we've had in the past, we'll, we'll talk about those as well. Um, I do, I, I used uh, my company slide template for tonight. I, I promise I'm not gonna be advertising or anything, um, but I just, it looks very nice. And I thought that I should probably share my affiliation. I work for a company called ABS Group and um, they're primarily um, specialized engineering topics for not only natural hazards, but a lot of maritime applications as well. So thank you again for having me. As I said earlier, we're big fans of the Carnegie Science Center. My younger son is in Lego camp this week. So if any of you recognize me walking around, dropping him off tomorrow, um, please say hello and introduce yourself. All right, let's see if I can. Get my slides going here. There we go. So just uh, before we get into the, the really technical stuff, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I did get my bachelor's in meteorology from Valparaiso University. So um, at least early on in my scientific career, I was primarily a storm chaser. I have a, a paper photograph there on the left-hand side of um, probably one of the prettiest tornadoes that I, I saw in my time storm chasing that was in Hastings, Nebraska um, a couple years ago. Um, and just learned a lot from that experience and got really interested in really what happens after the tornado. And that was kind of how I transitioned to wind engineering and emergency management. When I got to Texas Tech, I started focusing a little bit more on um, you know, kind of the post-disaster aspect of engineering. I think a lot of people see wind engineering and they think, oh, 
you know, I have this wind farm out by my house and I, I know nothing about wind turbines. I'm sorry if you're hoping to talk about that part of wind engineering tonight. I, I don't, I really don't know anything about them. I'm purely a hurricane tornado uh, engineering, that, that type of wind. So you can see in the, the middle photo there, um, that's actually myself and another colleague when we were students at Texas Tech, we're standing on uh, the, the supports for Highway 90 crossing Bay St. Louis in, coastal, in the coastal area of Mississippi right after Hurricane Katrina. Um, as many of you might remember the storm surge, the, 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 uh, the, the level of water rise that happened as a result of Katrina in coastal Mississippi was, it was close to 30 feet and it caused catastrophic damage in that part of the country. You can see in the background, um, there's another roadway bridge where the roadway was completely lifted off of its support and dumped into the bay and the same thing has happened where we're standing. So. Um, really interesting, interesting, uh, and and tragic and uh, events that that took place down there. But I was fortunate to get the opportunity to uh, perform some some data collection and damage assessment for FEMA and some of my colleagues at Texas Tech who were studying um, structural failures and got some really uh, interesting experience in the the, the post disaster environment down there. Um, so then after graduation, I did, I worked at IBM for a long time and a lot of people say, oh, what, what, what does, what does meteorology and, and engineering have to do with computers? Well, IBM doesn't really make computers anymore, even though they did for many years, they sold that part of the business off to Lenovo, which some of you may, may know, um, you know, Lenovo laptops, they sell them at Costco now, but has nothing to do with IBM. I have uh, no skill whatsoever in, in building laptops. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. Um, but what they do now instead is a lot of software development, a lot of computer applications. And um, you know, that, that was where I worked. We do a lot of government consulting. Um, even now at ABS Group, I've been with them for uh, about two and a half years at this point. And uh, if you if you work in the exciting world of government contracting, you know that any company that has the skill set that the government is looking for, they're usually welcome to to bid on those RFPs, and so that that's how I end up doing most of my work for for FEMA, for DHS, for um, Army Corps of Engineers, NOAA, National Weather Service, and so on. The program that I work on mostly now is called Hazus. Um, if you're familiar with it, that's awesome. If not, it's a freely available uh, software program that FEMA distributes to anyone anyone internationally or, or nationally who wants to, to download it. Um, you can just search for it on FEMA.gov and um, find out all about it there. It's it's available to the public. The, the goal of, for Hazus is to provide like a standardized methodology um, that both FEMA and anyone in the pub, anyone, you know, it, it, a local or state or, or in academics um, can use to estimate the, the impacts of a disaster. So they're specifically looking at structural impacts from a civil engineering standpoint, um, and then also economic impacts as well. So you can check it out. It's uh, free, free to, to anybody who wants to, to take a look. But today, mostly, I want to talk about some interesting engineering problems that we face in emergency management. And um, some of them we've dealt with really well, and some of them we're still kind of in the early stages of figuring out what we want to do. Um, probably the most important thing to understand is if you're not familiar with emergency management in general, uh, we 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 place everything in the context of a four phase life cycle. So all the activities that we do in emergency management will revolve around this language. And you'll probably hear me use these terms a lot to describe the different things that we're doing. Uh, usually what happens is there will, you know, we'll have some kind of disaster, whether it's a hurricane. I use hurricane as my example a lot because that's my background, but it could be anything really. It could be an earthquake, it could be a COVID pandemic, it could be a, another pandemic that's not COVID, or even something like a man-made terrorist event like um, 
uh, September 11th or you know, not a terrorist event, but still man-made like the, uh, the Exxon Valdez oil spill that happened years and years ago. Um, usually we'll, we'll have some kind of disaster that, you know, sometimes we're prepared, sometimes we're not. Um, but what'll happen is we'll go into what's called the response phase, which is usually um, life-sustaining and property protecting those, uh, you know, critical, critical activities that, that will, um, you know, just minimize damage and loss of life as much as possible. So this will be a lot of, you know, emergency medical services. So uh, EMS, police, fire, uh, a lot of the first responder uh, tasks will be, you know, part of risk fall under response. We might be sheltering or evacuating people from an area if necessary or performing search and rescue if the evacuations didn't happen in time. Um, anything that can reduce the immediate impact of that disaster will be in the response phase. And once that, you know, eventually the disaster will clear one way or another, and that's when we'll move into the recovery phase where everybody kind of comes out of their, their sheltering area and says, okay, you know, now we have to assess what happened. We need to activate our recovery protocols. It's a lot of, you know, sort of damage assessment, cleanup of debris, or if you need to rebuild or reconstruct anything and, um, you know, restoration of critical functions. So, you know, getting the power back on, getting the water running again, getting gas lines repaired, um, you know, getting traffic traffic signals working with, with the power and getting those debris cleared out of the roadway so that people can start to move around. That's usually what you see in the recovery phase. Eventually, we'll, you know, we'll feel for the most part recovered from an event and we'll move into mitigation and preparedness and mitigation especially is what I want to talk about today a little bit of preparedness as well but um, th these are the activities this is where we spend I don't want to call it downtime um, but you know I think the response phase probably gets 80 to 90 percent of the media attention that you hear around disasters um, people you know unfortunately disasters make for good television. They usually sell a lot of paper, get a lot of clicks on, on news stories because, you know, people respond to, uh, the, you know, a lot of the, the images and the, the stories that you hear coming out of an active response phase after, um, after a disaster. However, that's not, you know, usually that's a very small amount of time relative to what emergency managers are doing the rest of the time when there's not an active disaster. Fortunately, we, we don't live in a world where catastrophe is, you know, a daily occurrence in the same location for, for most parts of the world. So um, even though you might you might think of emergency management as being mostly that that disaster and that immediate response phase and maybe a little bit of recovery, actually the, the majority of our time is spent in mitigation and preparedness. And in those two phases, we're mostly asking ourselves, you know, how can we prevent a disaster from happening? Or if we just came out of that response and recovery cycle, how can we prevent that from happening again? How can we minimize the effects going forward um, if we have the same, the same type of disaster happen twice? So something to keep in mind, um, this, this is just the framework that we usually use, the language that we use as emergency managers to describe the different tasks that we're doing. So getting into some of the, the civil engineering topics that I want to cover, um, mitigation has kind of enjoyed a, a resurgence or, or increased popularity over the last 20 years or so, starting with there was the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000, which mandated different uh, mitigation planning protocols with, with local, state, and federal government. Um, and now it's, it's uh, you know, HMGP is one of the larger grant programs that FEMA administers where they're hoping to, rather than have to pay out more funds after a disaster in the form of public and, and individual assistance, they wanna be able to give more dollars on the mitigation side. And hopefully, you know, that's the hope is that we'll reduce what we have to spend after the disaster by investing more in mitigation. And I mean, there's there's some really interesting projects, especially from an engineering standpoint on the mitigation side for you know, every type of hazard and every type of engineering. 
Um, when I was in Lubbock at, at Texas Tech, I worked on tornado safe room grants. You can um, you can buy a little a little uh, reinforced like uh, it almost looks like a bomb shelter, and you can either bury that in your yard. You can get a grant to uh, like retrofit an interior room for your house. If you if you don't want to dig a hole in the backyard, you can you can. Uh, uh, reinforce like a bathroom or something and then you'll have a place to to take shelter during a tornado uh, but that you know that's one example from wind there's also uh, bridge retrofitting is a, is a popular one for hmgp which you know typically the grant applications for bridge retrofits are coming through um, the, the flood component that, that fema manages but you know so many of us, I think, in Pittsburgh remember what happened earlier this winter with the Panther Hollow Bridge. There, I mean, that wasn't that collapse was not caused by a flood by any means, um, but probably would have benefited from from some retrofitting um, to prevent to prevent that happening in the first place. Um, earthquake is another example. I'm not super familiar with earthquakes. <laughs> I'm obviously on the, the wind and weather side of things, but some of my colleagues out in California have said that, that ball bearing foundations are a, a popular choice for earthquake mitigation. I, I guess I'm not entirely sure how it works, but I guess they, they have you know, ball bearings that they place in different parts of the foundation of a building so that when the earth starts moving back and forth in an earthquake, the, the building, um, you know, can move with it rather than getting, um, you know, uh, any of the, the twisting strain or anything that might cause uh, failure um, from, from the motion of the ground. Floodplain reclamation is also a huge one. Um, FEMA, of course, it administers the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. So if, if you've bought a house, you've probably had a conversation, whether you realized it or not, with either somebody from FEMA or somebody who knows about flood, flood insurance, because it's, it's uh, legally required. And if you own a property within certain FEMA designated floodplains, you have to purchase uh, flood insurance. For those properties and um that that's that's actually another thing that we work quite a bit on outside of houses is um you know, the the flood insurance component and just making sure that we don't have too many people living in areas that flood quite a bit because that, that's actually a really uh easy way to mitigate flood damage is to just remove a structure from a floodplain entirely or, or make it prohibitively expensive through flood insurance. But what I mainly want to talk about as far as the civil engineering side is uh, wind mitigation that we've seen be very successful in hurricanes over the last 20 years or so. And I have three photos on this slide that probably all look the same to the untrained eye, but actually show three different um, really valuable techniques for preventing hurricane damage in coastal, coastal structures. So the photo at the top, these are all from Grand Isle, Louisiana, which is right, it's the very uh, southernmost fringe of the landmass in Louisiana. So about an hour south of New Orleans, right on the Gulf, it's, it's uh, I guess a barrier island um, down on, in, on the Gulf Coast there. But the top photo shows um, the stilt foundations, which this isn't unique to Louisiana. You see it in a lot of low-lying coastal areas. But um, what you want to do is raise a home structure up as high, as high as you safely can on these stilts, because that'll allow storm surge waters to just pass right underneath um, the structure of the home. And you see these in, uh, I, I think, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. They're pretty common, too. Um, so that top photo there showing, you know, that house is making use of every inch of that platform um, that's sitting up on the stilts. So that's a great way uh, to, to, you know, keep the water out of your home. And obviously, this, all three of these structures performed well um, in, in Ida from last year. So the second one then is showing what you can see on the on the right hand side, the one with the, the little Saints logo on the deck. Um, notice how I'm going to bring my cursor and I hope I can point it out. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but notice that this one has supports that are almost holding the roof down there. They go they go up along the side of the house and then over the top of the roof. 
And that's really good. That's that helps with the wind damage as well. So not only do you have the storm surge water that's flowing freely through that that stilt foundation on the bottom, but you also have a brace that's going to hold the roof in place. Because uh, if you've seen footage of tornado damage or hurricane damage, a lot of the times that roof to wall connection is the first part that fails. And then once you've breached the inside of the home, you can get the, the pressure of the air and the water pushing out on the walls. Um, if you if you take that roof off, you're much more likely to have total collapse of the, of the structure. Um, the bottom one is my favorite because what we're seeing even in just the last five years is these platforms that extend beyond the perimeter of the home. And what what will happen, what we started to see during Ida, which just made landfall in Grand Isle last, last summer, um, <clears throat> we'll start to see straps, people will get, mobile home straps that are typically used for the foundation, but they've been retrofitted to go from one end of the platform to the other, strapping that mobile home on onto the platform and onto the roof and holding it in place. And I, I actually saw one of these in action. Uh, I was just watching CNN coverage of Ida last year, and they had drone footage of, of damage right after the storm came through. And um, I, I was watching, I was, I was in a meeting with the, some of our, our Hazus team from, from the FEMA side, and I said, oh, guys, look, turn on CNN and look at this house. It looks like they strapped a mobile home onto a deck, and, and sure enough, that's exactly what it was. One of the other FEMA guys had seen it in the same thing in North Carolina, and, uh, you know, the, the house was in one piece. It really hadn't suffered that much damage at all, and it's funny to think how far we've come, you know, Katrina was in 2005. And you think it, for somebody to have a mobile home in Grand Isle, Louisiana, and to not evacuate for a Cat 4 hurricane, because they, they, they felt confident enough in their house, or, or if they did evacuate, you know, they, they still felt comfortable with the home structure the way it was. And to, to have no damage there, I, that would have been almost unthinkable during Katrina. The, this is an area that was, that was wiped out and devastated. I, it, was, it was a bigger storm surge, but um, not, not a stronger storm necessarily. So I think it, it shows that we've, you know, we've, come, we've advanced in our thinking and we've come a long way. We've learned lessons from, from uh, mistakes in the past with construction practices. And now some of these are being codified in uh, building codes. We see that, especially in the state of Florida, they have really probably the best, best hurricane building codes in the country. All right, I've got to move my cursor here. There we go. Um, so this is an example of what I work on on a day-to-day -day basis in the Hazus program, a little bit, a little bit different from some of the more construction-based techniques that we were talking about with the manufactured housing. Another thing we can do is try to identify damage functions for different types of structures. And these functions you can see uh, hopefully on the, the graphic here, we're trying to, for any hazard or for, for any structure type, we want to get an equation that governs um, the, the probability of damage or the, the percentage of damage, the, the, the actual um, state of damage on a structure as a function of whatever you use to measure the hazard. So in this case, it would be dam probability of damage as a function of wind speed. Uh, but you can also do this for earthquake, um, probability of damage as a result of the ground motion or um, Flood would be the, the damage state as a result or as a function of the, the depth of the floodwaters. So <clears throat> the more building types we have and the more curves we can develop, the better we can model um, the potential impacts and damages to the different structure types. And FEMA just last year completed a, a large scale survey of construction practices in Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands because the development at, at the time when Hurricane Maria went through that area, they didn't ha they didn't have that data yet. They, we had only done this for the continental United States and the the you know the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast that were susceptible to hurricanes in that part of the country. We hadn't considered 
uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And obviously Maria was hugely devastating um, down in that area. So FEMA said, all right, uh, clearly we need to, you know, expand HAZUS, expand our modeling capability to handle the Caribbean territories also. And so, um, you know, that we were able to add a lot of data that way. You can see on the, the left-hand side, we've got the, the structure types. We probably have over a hundred structure types in here. Wood frame uh, residential is probably 80 to 90% of the buildings that we find on the mainland US, but that's not the case in the Caribbean territories. A lot of them are unreinforced masonry with metal roofing, which is, you know, the, those behave a lot differently in hurricane force winds. Um, we try to get as detailed as possible also. So you'll see in the, the bottom left there, the, the building characteristics, um, you can adjust these curves for whether you have a hip or a gable roof, because those will behave differently in high winds, um, the type of roof to wall connection. So the space the size of your nails and the spacing of your nails that are holding the roof onto the building, that, that's critical for uh, building performance in, in high wind environments. Um, you see shutters are another example. You can adjust the curves depending on if your structure has um, hurricane shutters. Those are pretty common in Florida. They, sometimes they look like garage doors too coming down over the windows. So FEMA's ultimate goal here is to not only gather this data and be able to correctly predict how buildings will perform in different hazard scenarios, but from a software standpoint, they also would like to someday make this data available open source so that you don't have to go through the hassle of downloading their models and learning to work their models. And, and uh, you know, if you need software licensing and all that, it can be a bit messy. They, they would prefer uh, to just have the data on the modules available on something like GitHub, and then you can, you can uh, take Take the take the raw data, the, the equations for the curves, and use them in your, your own modeling your own your own modeling uh, environments. So I talked a little about a little bit about Hurricane Ida and Katrina as well, but I just wanted to put up this comparison so that you could get an understanding of uh, how similar these two storms were and. It, what what a win it was for mitigation to be able to look back almost 20 years now at this point to Katrina and say, oh, you know what, we, we've, we've fixed a lot of the problems. We learned a lot of lessons from Katrina and we've been able to respond to those. And it, I thought the most interesting thing to me about Ida, and I'll, I'll leave this up for a minute so you guys can just compare. I mean, they made landfall on this August 29th. <laughs> what are the odds? Um, very similar storm, rapidly intensifying over the Gulf, and you know, it just expected to cause major damage when they made landfall. Of course, Katrina did exactly that, but Ida really didn't. I think a lot of people saw uh, the forecast for Ida last last summer and thought, "Oh, that's going to be another Katrina. We're like we're in trouble." But you know, then it it wasn't. We really. Um, you know, we got in. We got into New Orleans. We figured out the, the problem with the levee. The, the overtopping of the levees was obviously a huge issue during Hurricane Katrina. That wasn't a problem in Hurricane Ida. Um, fortunately, the Ida didn't have quite as big a storm surge. But I, you know, I think that with some of those new construction practices, it, it probably. Um, it probably would have made a difference if we had seen more more storm surge from Ida. Maybe the most interesting thing between these two storms is that neither, in neither case did uh, New Orleans order a large scale evacuation. They, they did order some eva evacs during Katrina, um, but Ida was actually a really fast moving storm and it was intensifying so rapidly that this, the city of New Orleans decided not to evacuate. They issued shelter in place and their thinking was that people would, they would start to evacuate and then they would get stuck in their cars because the storm was moving so quickly. And so they said, no, <laughs> we were, everybody who was watching this from, you know, the, the emergency management side was thinking, oh no, <laughs> you know, they're not evacuating New Orleans and they got the exact same thing as Katrina heading towards them. But it, it turned out, I don't want to say totally fine, but there, there was 
nowhere near the level of damage from Ida that there was from Katrina. And it, it was the right call in the end because most likely there would have been more casualties or fatalities had had people um, been stuck in their cars on the interstate when, when Ida made landfall. And, um, you know, instead they just had a couple weeks without power, which it's hot in New Orleans, I get it. It's not convenient, but certainly manageable um, from a city, city emergency management standpoint. So that's the good news. Uh, the, the, the mitigation from a civil engineering standpoint was, that was a success story for, from the, the perspective of hurricanes. I think though, emergency management in general is still a new industry. We, we only saw the, the formation of FEMA in the late 1970s. So even FEMA hasn't been around that long compared to other other government agencies and other major industries that are that are have that uh, government component. So, I guess what I'd like to see happen in the future, and this not only in practice but also in on the academic side where we're conducting research, I'd like to see more industrial engineering principles enter and have the same thing happen with what happened with the civil engineering side, where we start to adopt these, the, the tools that are available to us, some of the mathematical techniques, and it, it improves the, the industry overall. One of the things that I really like about industrial engineering is the management science side of things, which says that, you know, you really you really have to have a good um, statistical or quantitative understanding of a system that you're trying to manage. And the, the, the more you can sort of pin that down and, and have uh, standards and, and quantifiable measurements on either a process or um, a framework or something that you're working with and trying to manage, the, the, the more you can quantify that, the easier it'll be in the end to manage. And I think that's really important for emergency managers because we, we don't really have that right now. And the example I like to give this, I like to put up this uh, nightmare photo of uh, contraflow gone horribly wrong, you know, an evacuation here. Actually, a lot of people don't realize there was this study done in 2006 that when you measure the, um, the, the ground evacuation of New Orleans following Katrina, it was extremely successful, more successful than was predicted. They managed to move more people in less amount of time than, than was expected. So you know, even though we see this horrible image on the news and think, oh my gosh, this is botched and, and this is terrible. There's, you know, gridlock and people running out of gas and everything. That may be true and that may be very uncomfortable for, you know, to maybe frustrating to, to watch that unfold on the news. But in reality, if you measure it against other evacuation standards, it may not be that bad. It may actually be that they're achieving exactly what, what they're hoping to achieve by moving more people out of the way of harm. Then I like to give kind of the, the counter example of this other image where this guy in a FEMA coat handing out uh, bottled water and everybody sees that and they think oh yes you know perfect we're doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing and and FEMA's you know they're on top of things and they're they're handing out commodities well if you measure that against the Stafford Act which is the legal precedent for how how um, commodities and aid is supposed to be re requested through the, the federal process Actually, somebody in FEMA shouldn't be handing out bottled water. That should come from local, then it should come from state, then it should come from National Guard, then maybe if all of those other systems fail, you might see somebody from FEMA handing out bottled water. So that's why it's important to have something to measure against, something quantifiable to measure against, because if we don't have that, we really don't know if we're doing a good job or not. And we kind of let the media dictate the narrative of, um, you know, of the disaster, whatever it happens to be. 
So this is my last slide and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, but just continuing along with that theme, just some interesting examples that I've seen of, of industrial engineering, you know, what, what industrial techniques can bring to emergency management. We need to be asking ourselves, like I was saying before, are we doing a good job? Is it working? Are, are you know, we're spending this money on mitigation, we're investing these mitigation dollars and trying to prevent, um, the, maybe even prevent the disaster from happening. Floodplain reclamation is a great example of that. If you have a building that floods in a floodplain, you can either rebuild it exactly as it was, and then you run the risk of the same thing happening if you have the same kind of flood, or you can just move it out of the floodplain or not rebuild in that exact location. Maybe you just need to move 50 feet, you know, uphill or something in a different direction. Um, <clears throat> now you've mitigated that flood for that for that particular structure. You, you, you've reduced the impacts or you may have reduced uh, another flooded building from happening at all if, if you've done the, the right things. So we need to constantly be asking ourselves, is our mitigation working any of the phases? Is our recovery working? Is our preparedness working? Um, is our response working? And I think that's what industrial engineering techniques can, can bring to the field. I like to give an example of the state of New Jersey. They, they thought that they were really on the ball with planning. And in 2015, they set up a full scale exercise, which is where they, all the all the coordinating agencies, FEMA, Department of Health, CDC, whoever it is, they'll they'll come together and they'll they'll simulate uh, you know whatever type of disaster they want to do. And in 2015, they chose a highly infectious upper respiratory influenza pandemic for their scenario. So when when I heard about this, I thought, oh, they they must have really knocked it out of the park with COVID then because they had this, this really detailed plan that came about from this full-scale exercise. They they you know had recorded all of everything that happened and their lessons learned. They figured how many hospital beds they would need, what kind of supplies, how to how to set up um, uh, they're called pod point, points of distribution for vaccines so that people can drive through or walk through and get a vaccine if needed. I thought, oh, but in reality, New Jersey, they didn't really perform any better than any of the other states. And there's an interesting news story. You can look it up on Google. I, if it's still one of the, on one of the uh, websites for the, one of the local news outlets. Um, they, they were interviewing some, they, they wrote this story and they said, well, you know, you, you're, you're in emergency management, you, you were part of this exercise, what happened to the plan? And the, the, the official who was being interviewed said, yeah, I, I don't know, we just kind of forgot about it. So that's the kind of thing where we need to say, okay, we thought we had this really good process for planning and preparation, but actually it didn't work that well. We kind of didn't follow it or, you know, maybe, or maybe we did follow it and it turned out to be not that effective for what we thought it was gonna manage. So that's one one way that we need to you know kind of think about are we are we doing a good job can we measure ourselves against any kind of standard um, the other example that I have on here and I'll I'll wrap up here quickly um, this is a study that one of my students did at Texas Tech she did her dissertation asking the question that I kind of alluded to earlier which was if we're spending money pre-disaster, we're investing more money in mitigation pre-disaster, um, is that resulting in less spending after the disaster? Are we saving ourselves money by, by putting, putting the dollars into mitigation up front? And so she just did a simple correlation. And what we were hoping to see was a strong negative correlation, right? Between, between the pre-disaster spending and the post-disaster because that what that would mean was that, um, you know, the, the, more you, the more you spend ahead of time in mitigation, hopefully the less you'll spend um, post-disaster because the mitigation will have worked. And, Actually, what we saw from reviewing the grant data and everything is on the table here on the right. It was actually a strong positive correlation, um, which that it's a little bit discouraging because 
it, you know, what that means is the more you're spending pre-disaster, the more you're spending post-disaster. I, I have a personal theory or a suspicion that that just means people, you know, that's kind of like indicating who's good at grant writing because you're like, you're good at getting the dollars pre-disaster and you're good at getting the dollars post-disaster. Um, but I don't know, we, we would have to do more follow-up studies to find out. Um, I highlighted the state, there was Michigan, New Mexico, and Guam, where the three, the three states or territories that had strong negative correlations. So somebody there is doing something right <laughs> with how they're spending their mitigation, mitigation dollars. Um, but you, I mean, those, you, you really can't think of three, three states or territories that have less in common. So I, I'm hoping that uh, she'll get fun. The student will get funding, and we can maybe do some follow-up studies and try to get to the bottom of this. But this is the kind of thing that I'm hoping. This is the kind of tools that industrial engineering might bring to emergency management. We can look at it from an engineering perspective. So, all right, my timer says 36 minutes, and this is my last slide. So I just want to thank you for listening and, and joining the webinar today. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or by email if you have any specific questions. Also, my publications, I, I try to keep them up to date on ResearchGate. So if you if you want to look up any specific titles and have questions, um, you know, just please reach out. I would love to, to talk and meet with you. All right. Thank you, Andrea. That is uh, you know, a lot to think about uh, and a lot, uh, you know, there were several moments there where I was, uh, you know, burying my, my face in my palm, especially when you're talking about New Jersey, uh, just to think about all that preparation that didn't, uh, you know, necessarily have the impact that we wanted it to. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and stop screen sharing, uh, we can jump into the Q&A. I see we've already got seven questions in the hopper here and we are going to uh get through usually we get through all the questions uh and folks will have some great questions that come up uh we're going to start out with a question from katie kitty mama um the dog. <laughs> hey there you go what's the dog's name nova <laughs> nova nice yeah. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> so in the beginning, you showed us your prettiest tornado, but what was the most dangerous slash destructive tornado you ever encountered? Uh, have you had any close calls while storm chasing? Luckily, I have not. Um, I My lifetime tornado count is pretty low relative to the pros. Um, I've probably seen five or six tornadoes in my lifetime. Um, my personal closest call was in Muleshoe, Texas, when we accidentally ended up right below the, the funnel. Mm -hmm. And wow. I, I was in the back seat and my professor was in the front seat. And I looked out the window and I said, oh, this kind of looks like the video you showed us in class. <laughs> and we all kind of went, oh, no, no, we got to get away. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, it was fine. Everything was fine. <laughs> Um, Obviously, you're here today, I, so that's it all worked out. Yes, still here, still here today. Um, but I will say, it's be, storm chasing is different now, and that's because mm. of the internet. Um, mm. When when I was chasing in undergrad, we didn't we didn't have phones with with radar on them, and now those everybody has a phone with radar on it, and that means that anybody who looks at the phone and says, "Oh, we're under a tornado warning," I'm going to go outside and see if I can see it. Um, or I'm going to drive down the road and see if I can see it. It's it's starting to become a problem out in the, the plain states, and I'm a little concerned yeah. about you know safety and and um, just how crowded sometimes it can get when there's a storm. Hmm. There's a lot of people that just just want to see what's going on, and they they can really you know they can get in accidents or it can get really dangerous. So wow. Yeah, I never thought about that you know, flip side of the coin with, you know, your phone being able to warn you, but also attracting more people out into yeah. potential dangerous yeah. situations. Yeah. Uh, and Katie also had another question here. How difficult was your transition from meteorology to engineering? <laughs> 
it actually wasn't too bad. And part of the reason is I was in a program that was designed for meteorologists to, to transfer over and vice versa, people with the engineering background. Um, it, was, it was actually a really cool program funded by National Science Foundation where they try to encourage different disciplines to work together on, on the same, same conceptual problem. So I don't know, you know, Matt, Calc 3 is Calc 3, no matter where you are or what you're <laughs> measuring. So it's, it, hel it helps to have the math background and then, you know, supportive people too. Great. Yeah. And I, I love what you're saying there about the interdisciplinary uh, focus that, you know, that we're seeing in a lot of fields these days. I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's only yep. going to benefit. Uh, th and this is just an editorial comment here, not even editorial, just uh, hosting a uh, peek behind the curtain. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, coming up, uh, we'll be able to speak to some folks about spotted lanternfly, especially mathematicians working on spotted lanternfly outbreaks. So that uh, interdisciplinary uh, aspect is just really, really interesting. And I love seeing all of that happening in, uh, in today's uh, you know, science fields. Uh, so here is another question from someone um, who chose to remain anonymous. Uh, why do you think people continue to buy homes in hurricane and flood prone areas? Uh, and there's, there's a part B there. Uh, also when people evacuate, where do they go? Are there evacuation centers for people or do they just go to families or friends uh, residences? Mm -hmm. I think, well, that's a great question. And I don't know the answer to that first part. You personally, you could not pay me to live on the beach. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have spent too long in this industry to want to live there. But, you know, that's me. Not everybody feels that way. Some people, they like the sunsets, they like the sand and the surf, and that's where they're going to live no matter what. So it, mm -hmm. it's a personal choice, I guess. Um, as far as evacuation, we've actually made great progress a lot, a lot because of Katrina too. The the what happened at the Superdome and the Convention Center in New Orleans. Um, I would say the majority of people will evacuate to family, friends, or hotels. Um, a lot, a lot of the times, hotels in you know the, like the the Gulf Coast area or you know Florida, Georgia, kind of that area. They'll they'll know when it's a hurricane. They'll offer reduced rates or mm. or you know, packages to make things easier for people to find find a place to stay. But if that's not an option for you, um, evacuation shelters have really vastly improved in the last 10 to 15 years to the point where even now, um, Louisiana has a system where you get a, a barcode wristband. So when you board, a, you, you, you'll board a bus, they'll scan your wristband. You will, when you get off the bus and you, they know what shelter you're at, um, they'll scan you again. And that way your friends and family can locate you. They'll, and they'll say, oh yeah, you know, she was uh, scanned in at, at uh, Baton Rouge or wh whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So they, they've really improved uh, the shelter system in recent years. Well, that is good to know. And hopefully no one here will have to uh, experience that firsthand. So it's good yes. to hear that, uh, yeah. you know, from you. Uh, so Christine has a question. Uh, uh, I believe the U.S.'s floodplain maps are very old and FEMA is aiming to update them. Do you anticipate when this is complete that Pittsburgh's flood risk will increase a lot to reflect the actual reality? <laughs> Yes, I, I do. I don't, I, you're right, they are, they are old, um, but they're in the process of being updated. So it's kind of a mixed bag right now. If you, if you go on the, um, the NFIP website, the, the FEMA, you can, you can go on the, on one of the FEMA.gov pages, enter, enter an address anywhere in the U.S. and it'll show you the flood map for that location. And they're in the process of modernizing those. They've they've been doing it for the last five or six years, and it's still ongoing. There was just a new a new thing passed through Congress to get to get some of that funding flowing. Um, so I, I don't know when I don't know when the Pittsburgh maps will be updated, but I'm sure it'll be soon. And mm -hmm. yes, I think probably our risk will have gone up when we get those yeah. new maps. And when they work on those new maps, is it more of just reflecting the, the current uh, and recent uh, trends or are they also, you know, projecting, you know, future trends that might get worse due to climate change? Mm -hmm. No, the climate change is definitely part of it. 
they're they're looking at what water rise everywhere for that increased rainfall too okay uh we've got another anonymous question that came in uh what are the top three things we can do as homeowners to mitigate risks in the pittsburgh area so that follows up pretty <laughs> nicely from the previous question um, well, number one is live on a hill, which is pretty easy to do around here. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't live in, in the hollow, live, live up at the top of the hill. Um, you know, as homeowners, it, there, there's already a system in place that's trying to discourage us from living in floodplains, and that's the, flood, the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I always encourage people, my, my sister-in-law was looking to buy a house in uh, Washington, DC. And I said, every time you go to an open house, send me your address and I will check it on, on the FEMA NFIP page and we'll figure out, because probably the worst thing you can do is get surprised by that. You know, find out you think your mortgage is gonna be so much and then, oh, surprise, you're in a floodplain. Now you owe another 400 or $500 a month in flood insurance, you know, because no. you chose this location. So. I know that's only two things <laughs> and if living on the hill isn't possible and you're you're further down and you think there might be a risk just check check before you you buy the property that um mm -hmm. you know that you're you don't have that requirement because i think i think those costs are only going to keep going up as they increase the risk yeah okay thank you for that one uh let's see we've got uh we've got five more open questions here but there's still time to get your questions in so if you've thought of one or maybe have a follow-up to one of the other questions that andrea's answered already uh still time to input that to the q a box in the bottom of your zoom window uh so john says we failed with covid how do we not repeat that for the next pandemic and you know judging by the news here that you know may turn out to uh you know use some lessons learned from covid to hopefully manage the you know monkeypox that's been spreading and now we've got tens of thousands of cases where a couple months ago we had you know you can count them on one hand yeah yeah unfortunately i don't have a good answer to this because i think we're i mean we're still in covid um mm -hmm. for the most part even if even if it's not being as widely advertised as it was during lockdown yeah. you know i i specifically tried to stay away from politics in this talk but unfortunately that is a huge component in any kind of disaster it certainly happened with covid mm -hmm. um and you know it, it drives everything unfortunately even down to how how much you get for disaster funding you know in a presidential declaration the likelihood of of receiving a declaration versus being declined for one it, it you know that it's it it, enter, it enters in it at every possible place where you where you don't want politics to be and you know, I, I don't know. You asked you asked me uh, six months or a year after Katrina, what are we going to do differently next time? I, I I might have had some ideas then, but I wouldn't have known. I can only say that now, ten or twenty years after the fact, that oh, okay, yeah, we you know we we learned a lesson here about uh, you know evacuating pets. People want to take their pets with them when they evacuate, so now all of our shelters are dog and cat friendly. You know that that's just something that comes about. So yeah, I wish I had a better answer for COVID, but unfortunately I don't, because I, I just, we're, we're still in it. For, we're still in the response phase yeah. um, for COVID. Yeah, so definitely not in that hindsight phase where we can gain all the wisdom that yeah. we might get from yeah. it in 10 years. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll get the next one better. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cross your fingers. Uh, so here's a question from Anna. We have spending correlations pre and post disaster by state, uh, or sorry, have spending correlations pre and post disaster by state been adjusted for spending proportional to population size? Uh, so yeah. it would be interesting to see how this changes year to year. Yes, um, they we we did adjust for population density in, in that study, um, mm -hmm. and actually, population density is is a big driver of of those those dollars. Um, the, mm. 
not just population by itself, but you know the, the number of people per square mile specifically um, can have a big impact on how, how many dollars get allocated to a certain area. So yeah, that would be really interesting. <laughs> I hope I hope, uh, I hope this student she I hope she gets to continue that research because um, we have a lot of questions on on the results that came hmm. out of that initial study. Again, fingers crossed on that one. Hopefully they get uh, the funding they need to continue that work. So we have a question here from Chris. Uh, flood insurance is expensive, but worthwhile for those who end up needing it. Uh, but many can't get it like we see in Kentucky recently. Should this be more broadly available with variable premiums depending on the risk in or near the floodplains? Uh, yeah, I, I think that would be a, a good way to go. Um, I, I know that the FEMA NFIP, they're, <laughs> you would think that they'd be focused mostly on like the technical aspect of, you know, deciding who, who is required to have flood insurance. And they are for sure, that's part of it. But there's also a, a, a pretty sizable group that is just working on like the customer experience of running an insurance company through the federal government, um, which is encouraging. I mean, I, I, I like that they're thinking along those lines. I don't, I don't know much about it or have much involvement with it, but you know, I've, I've kind of heard through the grapevine and seen some, some other conference presentations that, um, that they are, they're, lo they're looking at other options and they're thinking, how can we be, how can we as, the government behave more like a private sector insurance company and, and you know make make coverage more widely available yeah an interesting uh you know unique uh considerations that uh, unless you need that you know mm -hmm. flood insurance you're probably never going to think about it so that's a good right. thought <laughs> question right. thank you chris uh, we've got two questions left, uh, but if you still have a burning question, feel free to enter that in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll make sure we get to all of them here. Uh, Mike asks uh, or, or states, first of all, your presentation highlighted this, the statistical aspects of management science. Are there any of the mathematical programming and optimi optimi I think I'm supposed to say optimization, optimization. techniques <laughs> of management science, uh, for example, logistics, allocations of resources, et cetera, used in any of the four phases? Um, the short answer is no, but the long answer is I would love for uh, optimization to enter more into the logistics planning side of things. Um, I did. I have worked on a few projects. FEMA used to have an entire division devoted only to logistics, and that was when that was back closer to Katrina when I think there was still some public expectation for FEMA to be the ones personally handing out commodities following a disaster. They wanted to coordinate their logistics for that very tightly. Um, I feel like in the last 10 years or so, we've moved away from that where FEMA is taking more of the administrator role and they're just coordinating other agencies um, you know, to, to, to for for things like optimizing logistics, they're mm -hmm. um, you know they're just making recommendations to somebody like National Guard, who's actually in charge of you know putting putting a case of water in your trunk. So yeah, it, it's not really it's not there yet, and I think that would be a great a great place. You know, um, optimization would be it would be an awesome place to start. Okay, thank you. Good question, Mike. Uh, and the last question that we have here comes from Chris again. Uh, and uh, I think this one is really interesting. Is FEMA or some other agency looking at developing insurance for other disaster categories like tornadoes or wildfires? Uh, or should private insurance companies be required to include that coverage? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what conversations have taken place between the flood guys at FEMA and the tornado guys in private sector. Uh, I do know that uh, natural disasters like tornadoes, non-flood disasters like tornadoes or wildfires are big business in the reinsurance companies. So mm -hmm. they're like the big the big companies that insure the insurance companies, mm. they, you know, if State Farm takes a huge loss, then State Farm has insurance with somebody like Swiss Re. 
um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know what the, the easy answer to that would be or, or what conversations have taken place. I, I have a feeling the flood insurance program came about because somebody saw a need and that need was probably already being met for the other hazards by mm -hmm. the, the existing companies. Um, wildfires, I, I wish I knew <laughs> how, they, how they're going to do that. Wildfires seems like I don't we're, like it's like we've only started talking about them more recently. I don't know if that's an impact of climate change or or you know the the, the news cycle. We're just seeing more of them nope. now. It, it could be all of those things. Um, but yeah, wildfire insurance. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I I would guess too that you know just being tied to that physical geographic location uh, in a floodplain you know, there's that risk is always mm -hmm. there. Whereas, you know, a, a mm -hmm. tornado or a wildfire can be so variable yeah. um, that, you know, I would guess that's probably coming into play too. Uh, yeah, and Chris has one point. more question that uh, came in here. Uh, <laughs> FEMA often gets beaten up when the response yeah. goes poorly. Uh, and you've mentioned some good success stories with grants and prevention. Uh, shouldn't FEMA try to get these prevention stories out more widely, like you mentioned with the Louisiana, Louisiana Grand Island after Ida? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. How, yeah, how are their marketing uh, folks doing down there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they they've tried. I, I've I've seen I've seen some some uh, you know pu public uh, yeah marketing I guess is the word for it. So some some pushes in that direction. Um, I think what's the bigger issue is that the, the public, well, there's two. Number one is that success stories don't make for interesting news. Mm -hmm. It's it's an unfortunate reality of disasters that you, you, know, you just don't get credit for close saves. It, if, you, if you have something that easily could have been destroyed but doesn't, there's usually not a news crew standing there saying, hey, <laughs> like we didn't get hit by, this house didn't get hit by a tornado. And that's just the nature of the news yeah. media, and I and I understand. Um, but the, you know, it's part of the problem. But then I think another another issue is that FEMA really needs to educate the public on what FEMA's role is. Um, mm. Which in the Stafford, if you look at that that uh, overly complicated flowchart that I posted <laughs> that shows the Stafford Act, um, you know, really the. The, the responsibility for, for managing a disaster, for containing the response phase, first of all, to the locality, the, you know, the municipality or the county. Um, if that collapses, then it goes to state. And if state is not able, if state is overwhelmed and unable to respond, then it goes to federal. And, you know, at that point, you're asking somebody who has zero knowledge of a local area to essentially come in and sit and rescue them. Um, you know, FEMA doesn't have FEMA doesn't have like helicopter pilots that you would need in a water rescue. They don't have truck drivers that you would need to transport bottled water. That that all has to be arranged and coordinated and administrated. So they do tend to get beaten up. I, some of it's not their fault, but I think they also could do a better job of just educating the public on what, like, what FEMA's role actually is in in some of these disasters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's those are uh, fair points there, and you know, so many people just know what they saw, you know, with yeah. the FEMA tents and Katrina, um, you know, and that's where you know that that image just gets burned in your brain that that's what they do when really they're doing so much other administrative stuff, like you yeah. said. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have one final question here from uh, Katie again. Uh, have you worked internationally on natural disasters? Uh, so that's mostly, uh, you know, primarily just domestic work then. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can have a conjecture here for the rest of the question. Uh, so what do you think might be the differences between the U.S. Uh, and, and other countries in disaster response? Yeah, unfortunately, I, or, or maybe fortunately, I, I haven't worked internationally. Um, the, 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 closest, the closest thing I have is the student who uh, did that study that I showed with the, the correlation between pre and post spending. 
uh, she she was from Germany and she she went back home after she graduated and and is now living and working in Germany. Um, but from occasionally when I talk to her, it, it sounds like uh, Western Europe might have very similar issues to what mm. we have, um, which is that. You know, no matter where you go in the world, emergency management in general just isn't a, a mature uh, industry yet. It, we it, we just haven't been around long enough to to have whether it's um, you know recognizable brand names or companies who have been doing this for a hundred years. We don't have that yet. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, more if you go back before the 1970s it was really handled by the military um and mm. they were their primary concern was a lot of you know post-war and and cold war kind of you know oh the the way we prepare for a disaster is like duck and cover or you know we prepare people to um for for a bomb or for an attacker and you know that's not a hurricane is not really the same thing as as an invading army it, it's you right. gotta manage it two different ways um, and that, but that's just where we are, you know, that, that's where the thinking has evolved. And um, I guess I'm just hoping, one of the reasons I'm, I'm so uh, you know passionate, I guess, about the quantifying things and measuring things and coming up with industry standards is because we don't have them yet. And I think once we do, we'll, we'll uh, you know, emergency management will sort of take off into this, this uh, much bigger industry than it is now. Great. Well, thank you for your insights on that. Even though you've not worked internationally, I, you know, <laughs> we we do appreciate your your insight there. Uh, so that takes us to the end of our questions. So I would love to take this uh, opportunity to thank you, Andrea, for being here tonight, and uh, thank our audience for being here tonight too. We appreciate uh, all of you for spending an evening with us and enriching uh, your lives with some science. Uh, we are in the process of locking down and confirming our September speaker. So keep your eyes on our webpage, CarnegieScienceCenter.org, uh, for those details as soon as we have them confirmed uh, for September's Cafe Sci presentation. And as I mentioned before, we will be moving back on site uh, in October after uh, all the you know, scheduling conflicts of summer holidays are behind us. We'll be back on site. Uh, so Andrea, thanks again. It was a lovely uh, experience having you here and all of your expertise. And we'll see you all again at the next Cafe Sci. Thanks, everybody.